Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper and Onar with you. And we're going to be discussing uh, this comment here from New Intellectual. He says, please don't be influenced by the likes of Jordan B. Peterson and Onar. So he's grouping those two together. He says, the left was never our standard. We should com that we should compare these so-called right-wing mystic intellectuals and choose the lesser evil. We have our own correct moral principles, and we should judge them all by that standard. Well, Onar, are you, are you on the uh, bandwagon with Jordan Peterson, let's just spread Christianity? No, uh, that's, uh, that's a false reading of, of me. But I do understand why it's easy to think like that, because if you are a, a, like a D-type thinker, then you group together M and I very easily. If, you're an, if you are an M-type thinker, you group together disintegration and, in, and integration. So, for instance, as I've mentioned before, uh, if, uh, if someone is dogmatic, they can't see the difference between being practical and pragmatic. If someone is um, pragmatic, they can't see the difference between being principled and dogmatic. They see them. So grouping together is 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 a common mistake. Though. So I, I like I understand why people say, oh, he's talking about something that Jordan P. Peterson's also talking about. Therefore, they are just talking about the same thing. Uh, it's a common mistake, but that's not uh, that's so not correct. So I think that in order to distinguish. Uh, uh, myself from uh, Peterson, I should talk about a little bit what's wrong with Jordan Peterson. Indeed, like, so, uh, you're, because you're not now fully, you're not completely enamored with him. Um, you just come along, and Jordan Peterson's there saying Christianity has a couple of virtues that we could admit to, guys, and you're coming along and saying there are some parallels between Christianity and a good philosophy, whatever a good philosophy would be, because so, it echoes reality, right? That's all so, you're doing. That, that, that's right. So in, in, the, in the two videos we did on religion and objectivism, well, that, what, that was an attempt at creating a linguistic bridge between objectivism and Christianity so that objectivists can understand what part of Christianity is actually not bad, and it's a path for Christians to understand Oh, so we have something in common with objectivism. We shouldn't listen more to the objectivists, what they're saying, that kind of thing. So we uh, can let's propose to the Christians that objectivism is a philosophy that's um, uh, consistent with reality, whereas Christianity is an old set of traditions with a few things that are true, but it's mixed with a lot of other stuff. And they could get to a more stable way of life, a more reasonable way of life by going towards objectivism and dropping the mystical stuff of Christianity. That's the type of conversation we can have with the more reasonable Christians. But at the end of the day, we can also admit to ourselves that somebody's going to church down here isn't such a bad person. They've got a background philosophy that we don't need to worry too much about until we do, until we do need to worry about it, and then we will. And as I, as I very often state, if you're mani managing to get someone to stop believing in, in Jesus or whatever, then there's a 90% likelihood that he will become a communist, a statist, a postmodernist, a green guyist, uh, uh, yeah, a progressive, what have you. He's going, there's a 90% chance that once someone loses their faith, they're going to become just pure evil. So we are in the 10% of atheism that is not evil. Uh, but uh, the, so uh, uh, it's very hard to pick people up for, into the, that 10%. And we want them into that 10% category. But we also have to recognize that this constant slamming of, of Christianity it's not mostly leading people to become communists and progressives and all of that crap. So there has to be a way for, for Christians to see that there is a good way to go to a more secular worldview that doesn't involve becoming a pure evil monster like the communists and the progressives. Do you think the obleftivists sort of have this issue that they, if they had a more positive view of the 
regular Christians in America, then they wouldn't be so worried about the fact the regular Christians in America have voted for Trump. They would be excited about it instead of worried about it. I, I think so. Uh, I, this is also one of the reasons I'm making this bridge. It's like I'm not just making this bridge, the linguistic bridge, for Christians to become objectivists. That's, that's, that, that'll be great. But I'm also making a bridge so that objectivists can see, you have new goggles to see which part of Christianity is actually okay. What's in there that's, that, that, can, that has an anchor in reality? Yeah, now that's what upset um, New Intellectual there. He says, uh, we have our, our own correct moral principles, and we should judge them all by that standard. So are you failing to judge them by our correct moral principles when you allow them to have their faith in God? I mean, you're saying faith in God means truth to reality in the... Right? Well, in the, the, the secularized version of faith does actually mean that. And we can, we can claim that pretty strongly because there's not a God. And their religious principles of being honest... For example, take that as one example, the religious principle of honesty, um, adheres them to reality even though there's not a God. They, they have a, a narrative and a reason to, to believe that they should be honest. So, in the absence of a God, these people are acting in a good way. Now, how can we explain that? I mean... We have to explain that by saying that they have some objectively true principle that has been woven into their religion. So that's the only claim we're making. Religions, some religions, have some objectively true principles woven into them. That's not such now, a strong claim. For the new intellectual, is going to answer all. Well, that's obvious that all uh, all religions contain some truth, but we should still hammer them because uh, it's uh, you're opening up for mysticism. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that view. I mean, <clears throat> uh, before, this was my like uh, standard way of thinking. It's, what was a, like an oh, eye-opener to me is when I started realizing uh, that religion is in our genes. And by that I mean it evolved through natural selection, and it's so deeply ingrained in our not in our uh, in our. Uh, uh, biology that you can't just easily get rid of it. So it's I had the opposite uh, like uh, epiphany of Kant. Kant said, "Oh my goodness, this recent thing is really taking over. I have to cripple reason in order to make room for faith." And what I'm uh, just discovered is that we don't have to worry about faith. Uh, uh, going away, uh, like if Kant was, that was a misplaced uh, worry, because faith pops up everywhere. Like, uh, uh, And I mean faith now in the mystic sense. Uh, so you have the Gaiaists. I mean, once you got rid of Christianity, what took its place? Statism, progressivism, communism, uh, Gaiaism, any kind of ism uh, that is just bad. Uh, and that was because Christianity was, uh, was weakened. So what took over after Christianity was not reason. It was a new religion, which was like virulently cancerous, as, as opposed to the, 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 the Christianity, which had, been, had succeeded in weeding out its cancerous elements over 2,000 years. Now, are you proposing that we're stuck with religion and we just should choose a religion to buddy up with? <laughs> No, uh, well, we're, we're first part. We're stuck with religion. Religion isn't realistically going to go away uh, in the near future. I mean, you you have to, like it can be eventually be weeded out of our genes through natural selection, um, but that's not going to happen overnight. So, like in the next, in the foreseeable future, religion is here to stay. Um, how, but, how do you so, mean it's in our genes? Maybe we better it, talk about that, because what does that mean? I mean, okay. it's not, it's so not it, my genes. Are you religious? No. Well, so, uh, uh, as if Jordan Peterson would say that anyone who 
uses metaphoric language, who uses stories as in an integral part of making their life tick, are religious at heart. So he would say narrative is fundamentally religious. Yeah, and he would he says that certain people act like they believe in God. Yes, precisely. So what I so I, I'm like what I mean when I say that religion is in our genes. You can substitute religion with metaphor and narrative. All right. Some some uh, we tend to want or crave a larger narrative? Yes. Let me give you an example from my own life, which is not religious, but it's still a narrative. Like, recently I was working in, in the garden with like a high-pressure hose, removing some uh, stains from, uh, from mold and stuff like that. Uh, it was, I, I have a bad physique because I'm, I'm ill, so it was really hard work for me to do this, and I did this over several days. And I like I I use, spent using my consciousness focusing on this task of cleaning up these rocks and stones and the pavements using this high pressure water, and uh, it, afterwards when I see the, the result when it's clean I've seen it clean before, but now I have a story attached to it. I can see myself uh, uh, working hard and and uh, after this battling with these. Uh, uh, stains and using hard work and feeling the pain, the result is something very good and positive. I see the result. I now appreciate the how clean it looks because I spent so much time and I have memories of that narrative, of that story of me creating this new, this brave new world. Now, I, is that religious? Jordan B. Peterson would say that it is. Right. So, um, so whatever that is, that tendency to like a, a story or a narrative or a backdrop to your or a meaning, a meaning to something. Meaning, yes. And notice that we have a meaning crisis, which means that we don't have a narrative. Lots of people are now depressed because they lack a narrative. Yeah, they lack a background story. And I've noticed now, what I'm saying a story here, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be a story about Jesus or about some supernatural entity, but this, that is a story, first and foremost. And uh, when, when we listen to stories and we're enamored with stories, it is our religious uh, genes at work. We like to think in terms of narratives. We like to put our life in a greater storyline, a narrative. We want to be a hero in a novel. And this is, and notice that Iran was very clear about this. Or, she wanted to live the heroic life. Or support the hero. Yeah, but that's, the, that's heroic too. I mean, what, what, what did Ayn Rand say about the heroic being, right? Uh, man, as she pictured man as a heroic being. Right. What is that? That is, she's picturing man as part in a narrative, a story, a novel. Right. How could you be a that, heroic being if there isn't a background for you to be a hero against? You have to have a story. What's your story? Now, that story doesn't have to be, like, supernatural, but it, it is a narrative. And there are players, there's a field, there's a battlefield, you're wielding a, some kind of sword, you're battling out. Now, I want to point out that a really good modern narrative, a really good modern story, is uh, the Declaration of Independence, the War of Independence, uh, the yeah. Civil War, and the development of the United States. And people who accept that as their background story have something pretty solid to hang their worldview on, and they have a pretty solid piece of ground to defend. <clears throat> now, the left understands the importance of narrative. And this is why they're so fundamentally religious at heart. So they have actually secularized religion to a very great degree. They, they call themselves atheists, but they're only about narrative. Everything is narrative. So notice that the new thing on the, on, on the field now is that they are pushing this, that uh, 4th of July was not the, independent, the, the, the most important day in American life, but it was 1619 when the slaves arrived or something like that. 
that was the, uh, <clears throat> the, the Constitution of America. Now, what they're trying to do there is to create a story, right? And if you believe that story, then America is evil and America needs to be destroyed. That's the only, so in that story, the hero is the one who destroys America because they're fighting slavery. Yeah. And everything what they do is about story. What, is, what does patriarchy mean? It's a story. It's like you have evil big guy and uh, you have a feminist fighting against evil patriarchy, right? Yeah. That's story. And what is Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto? He says there are two classes of people, the oppressors and the oppressed. And this has been throughout all of history. So we are now, the pro proletariat is just the latest in incarnation of this long, long historic narrative. I mean, people were so taken uh, by this storyline that they got a religious epiphany. It was a revelation to people to read that. Just like it was a revelation to me to read uh, Atlas Shrugged for the first time. You can call that a religious experience, even though it's secular and it's rational, but the feelings of awe, which Jordan Peterson talks a lot about, and uh, and the feeling of meaning, uh, or is this, the pure salience uh, revelation, was in place. And that's this, when people read the Communist Manifesto, they saw a story that they could make their life story, right? Now, there were people on the ground in Eastern Europe, we have their journals, who wrote about the Nazis as a new religion. They viewed it as a, as a religious, like with all the trappings of religion. And then later, when Soviet Russia took over Eastern Europe, they said the brown shirts are becoming red overnight. Yeah. And the new god is Stalin. So it was religion after religion after religion. People yep. on the ground were able to see it. People people wrote it down, and, and we have those things. But So, yeah, these are just lots of religions. Um, so we're going to have a religious narrative, and we're going to fight the environmentalists if we're not fighting yeah. anybody else. And now we're fighting evil global warming, as CO2, the, CO2, the satanic gas. Yeah, and our, right? sin, our sin is industry. And our punishment is the destruction of the world, like it always yes. is with religion. Yes. So, uh, and our sac we have to sacrifice by paying extra for our plastic bags, and so it's got yeah. all the trappings of religion. So, so we're stuck with religion. Then we can't fight it. Now, I say there's. Uh, if he, so, I want to just make it clear: if people don't like this, we're stuck with religion. Let's translate that. We're stuck with metaphors and narratives. Right. That's now, what that means. I was going to say, a lot of these religious people um, today, they are going back to church or whatever, but they don't believe that there's no, a God. They, no, they want to believe, and they're f feeling the salience of being part, part of a larger story. So we're stuck with a need for a story or a narrative. Yes, and if we don't provide the story, someone else is. And how, and so... I would just propose off the top of my head that it's going to be hard to come up with a time-tested story. But Jesus is a time-tested story. Yes, uh, so I, I don't think that there's just one story that's going to win out. I mean, uh, we might end up with a situation where we just have a, a like a menu uh, that Rucker was talking about, a menu of stories, uh -huh. and uh, people find the one story that fits best to them. Mythology. And, uh, a body of mm -hmm. mytho a body of mythology. Let's yeah. imagine. And like, I like the fact that when we were talking now, I see the emergence of a new uh, mythology around the elephant. Uh, That's nice. Right? Yeah. Now, also, we've got we do have a story we we that's already out there, which is this man took the thinkers away, and the the rest of the world collapsed without the thinkers. You know. I'm not sure that that story reverberates with anything. It doesn't. It doesn't echo any other particular stories. It doesn't echo a thread. It's not the latest link in a chain. It's sort of a, a stand by itself. But it does. It does. Um, it does echo with people. It does reverberate with people. 
Atlas Shrugged is one of the most successful uh, stories ever to have been told. And it's uh, that, that shows that it's probably going to be told a thousand years from now because it has staying power. <laughs> so it is reverber reverberating with something very deep within people, and that's good. But as you say, it's a very specific story, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't click with everyone, and it might not be sufficient for a story that is personalized and individualized. So those who become like uh, 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 born-again uh, uh, objectivists, they identify with the story of Atlas Shrugged and see everything in terms of that story, but it, then it be doesn't become a story about their own life, right? They're not creating their own story. So um, uh, I'm not saying that that's bad, that people become enamored with Atlas Shrugged. If everyone was enamored with Atlas Shrugged, I'd be very happy. Uh, but <clears throat> there's a lot of people who simply can't be enamored with that story because it doesn't resonate with their life situation, their needs in their personal life. And as long as we don't address this need for story stories in people's lives, that you're building a story, and it needs to have roots, it needs to have this infinity perspective or like lasting beyond just uh, the exist existence right now, then uh, objectivism is going to lose out uh, or to other people who are better storytellers. So that's what I mean when I say that religious religion is here to stay. The best storyteller wins. And we can make sure that the best stories are told uh, by rational people. That's the best we can hope for. And then this leads them to objectivism. Now, to, so, to return to the, the thing was Jordan Peterson and why he's wrong, but he's really good at telling a story. Yeah, what's wrong with his his idea? Where does he where does he go off then? Why why don't we why don't we just <coughs> jump on as fanboys on his bandwagon? He's tell he's got big crowds, he's attracting stadiums full of people, and he's able to keep their attention. Why don't we adopt his ways? What's wrong with what he's doing? Or or is there something wrong with or are we just fanboys of his? Jordan B. Peterson is um, not a good thinker. He's not a good conceptualizer. By concept, you mean taking several things that are similar, dropping the measurements, and seeing what's similar amongst them. Yes, he's bad at doing induction, induction from reality. Now, he does eventually land at some generalizations, <clears throat> But often after a very long time, and often not in a very clear and, and consistent manner. So he, he completely lacks the laser vision of Ayn Rand to make good concepts. I'll just go grab some water. I'll just be back. All right. So I'm going to bring on some Jordan Peterson for just a second there. Yeah. Let's see. So you would have been... You said seven. So when I guess it was like seventy four. Seventy probably seventy four because I was uh, seven years old. Right, I was born in sixty seven. Yeah, so you're five years. I see you're five years younger yeah. than me. So that yeah. so that places you there. So yeah, it was still pretty hippie central. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty interesting. Uh, it's sad to see that people are dis. That's what happens if you don't. So here we go. We'll just jump in here. We'll just see. I'll just let him babble for a minute. It's treat good. yourself like you matter. And then, well, what happens if you don't treat other people like they matter? Well, you lie to them, you cheat them, you steal, you, you, you enter into impulsive relationships with them. They can't trust you. That doesn't go anywhere. They don't like you. You, you end up alone at best and maybe, like, in, in, incarcerated at worst. And that doesn't work. And so you... So he talks about... Pretty mundane things, doesn't he, Jordan Peterson? He just talks about life and living, going through life, and how life is tough and how to live in this world. It's really very mundane, a lot of sort of mundane examples of life. Yes, and the very moment he starts moving away from the mundane, the very practical, where he's good, 
I'm moving ahead into the idea of or the space of conceptualization <clears throat> of abstraction. He fails. Um, uh, uh, it's not that he he's always wrong, but it's just doing a very bad job at it. So, for instance, he has no understanding, or like even if people have made him aware of this, he doesn't really understand that, uh, for instance, Nazism is not a right-wing phenomenon. He calls it the extreme right, and then communism is the extreme left, and he just he doesn't have any kind of understanding of this. And as I pointed out in an, another video, in, 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 whenever he brings out Ayn Rand in, in videos in a critical way, he says, I'm not an atomistic individualist like Ayn Rand. So that, that's, uh, but Ayn Rand was never atomistic in her, in her thinking. I can understand why it's easy for someone who doesn't understand her very well to think so, but she was never atomistic like D-type disintegration. And so he makes all of these errors, and many of them are very understandable. It's, I'm not saying that he's just an awful uh, thinker, but he's just unable to take what he has uh, mapped out. He's like, very good at like running around like a rabbit and mapping the world. And, and he's in his creative phase. And then when he's bringing it together, he doesn't quite have the, the, the juice, the mental power, to turn it into real uh, knowledge, so conceptual he, knowledge. So he ends up at slight, uh, slight thud, uh, where he says at the end, he says, um, so clean your room, be honest, get a job. Like that's his epiphany. Yes. Now, there's actually there's a lot of salience and, and like realization and importance behind that. It's not just saying clean. Behind that very banal statement, there is there is depth. So I'm not taking that away from him. But he's like, <clears throat> uh, I, I, to use a, a, a comical phrase, he's one French fry short of a happy meal. Uh, <laughs> uh, so like. Uh, he, uh, he he doesn't he, he's not able to finish the job he's not able to uh, bring it to a, a conclusion where he's conceptualizing and cleaning up his abstract room his his conceptual space now one way I think he could clean up at the end of the day and not leave such a mess <clears throat> is if he could link everything to happiness but he stops short of that and says happiness is superfluous and he and he <coughs> links everything to the responsibility or duty the duty to be responsible or the responsibility to have your to fulfill your duty or something i mean there's no place to go at the end he ends up at a cul-de-sac where he just says you've got to do tough things yes now notice that um when he says things like uh, uh, people are uh, in search of rights, that, that's, it's a, it's a, so he's conflating this search of rights not to be offended with individual rights, as if all right, rights are the same. So one of the phrases he says, sh people should be more concerned with responsibility than with rights. Now, he doesn't, that's, a, that's an example of a bad conceptualization, because he's not being, being very precise about what, uh, what kind of rights we should not be concerned with. Yeah. So, he, so he's he, bad on that, and he's bad on when he says uh, happiness so, is something that's just fleeting that happens, but it's, it's really not. If you're able to create a rational universe that you live in, then happiness can be created through your own actions. So if, if he was doing his, a proper job, instead of saying we shouldn't be so concerned with rights, he would be pointing out that's not a valid uh, idea of rights. Uh, we should be defending rights. We should be concerned with rights, like his right to freedom of speech. Yes. He says don't, don't be so concerned with rights, and yet he left his university and got in a big hubbub over his right to freedom of speech. Well, this again goes back to that when it comes to the conceptual level, he's a sloppy thinker. Yeah. So he's I, like, he, I would call him D-type. He, he, so he, he labels himself as a pragmatist. 
And in that sense that he refuses to make uh, generalizations and inductions, he is pragmatist. So that's a correct labeling of himself. Although he's on the verge of being integrated, he's just a little bit too short of it. So he keeps on being very close to having a realization, very close to the truth, but he just can't get there on his own. What is the truth that he can't get to? Now, for instance, one of the things I was able to abstract, because I'm a good thinker, from him making first running around, it's like when he said that uh, people are too... Cons- hold on. Uh, yes? Mom, is Toby here? No. No, she's not. Sorry. Well, neighbor boy was just asking for my daughter. Sorry. <laughs> All right. No problem. So uh, he, uh, he, when he says uh, happiness is just something that happens, it's uh, it, it happy, the bigger thing is pursuit of meaning. And at first I, I was uh, offended by that. But then I said, okay, I now I understand what he's saying in his very sloppy way. Uh, he's, not a, he's not a good thinker in that respect. So in, in one very si- uh, primitive sense, he's correct that pursuit of happiness can only be a a realistic goal inside the rational universe. Uh, When when I talked about rational karma before, like karma is a mystical concept because you're getting the reward in your next life, which doesn't exist. Whereas what I call rational karma is when you secularize that and say that good things happen in this life to good people because of their actions. Uh, uh, So in order to give it a name, a proper conceptualization, it's moral efficacy, moral causation, Mor- morality as a cause, where good causes good, bad causes bad. That is the rational universe. Now, Jordan Peterson can't get to that. No, because he's not that uh, uh, sophisticated. Uh, thing. Well, he's not uh, good enough to formulate those kind of generalizations. For him, moral action might just bring more suffering. Well, he, he doesn't see a way out because, like, he says, the best we can do is just to clean our room and hope for the best. Yeah. And, and, and that's because he, he's, he is, he's dense when it comes to the conclusions. He doesn't, and he's not able to, to go the final step and, and make a, a proper generalization. What I just did here now is something that you will never hear uh, Jordan Peterson say unless someone tells it to him, which is that uh, the rational universe is the space of moral causation, where good causes good and bad causes bad. That is my conceptualization that I induced from all my uh, listening to the babbling of Jordan Peterson and combining it with what I know from, from Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, I'm sure, would agree with that because she does talk about the rational universe. And this the, is precise. Uh, the moral is the practical. Yes. <clears throat> so the, the, the only thing that he adds to the conversation is that uh, there is a boundary to the, the, the rational universe where, uh, where moral causation breaks down. And these are exceptional, just like you have emergency law that is ex- an exception to normative ethics, then you have that the, let's call it the irrational universe or the, the, the malevolent universe, that is uh, the exception to the rational universe. The rational universe is the norm, and that is where you find normative ethics, that is where you find uh, moral causation, moral causality. <clears throat> and uh, this, I'm just giving now an example of if if Jordan Peterson was a truly good thinker, this is the conclusion he would reach, right? But now, he lacks that clarity. He doesn't have that in him. So we could say that Jordan Peterson is a lot like Christianity in that it has a few things that echo and parallel reality. Yes. And we shouldn't be striking him down as bad. Rather, that was like what he, when he comes along and says he's done a lot of groundwork but he just doesn't have the re- mental resources that it takes to finish the job. It's like a half-built building. So why not just take that and, and take the best of what he has and finish the job? Well, that's going to rile up some people. 
Take, well, it's because they want us to just reject him, reject Christianity, and just build our own thing totally without compromise, without any of their flawed stuff. No, what what uh, what I'm saying is that flawed people can, for various reasons, still stumble upon something that's not flawed. They can do something good every now and then. I mean, even a complete, even a progressive is able to cross the street without getting run over by a car. Henry Ford went to church. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you find a lot of uh, uh, people who do good things uh, partially every now and then, even though they have bad philosophies. And we shouldn't just reject everything because they are bad in some areas. We say, let's cut out the good stuff and throw out the bad stuff. Now, a lot of people will now say that the religion part, that, that cleaning the room is the good part, and the religious stuff, that's the bad part. I think that when there, there's some part of the religious talk of G. Peterson that is not uh, uh, very good, but mostly he's touching on something very important, which is that narrative is as important to human flourishing as anything else. I mean, if you don't have a story that you place yourself as the hero in, then you're going, going to run into a meaning crisis, most likely. Now, Christianity, if, I mean, let's just take that <laughs> sentence, a story where you're the hero. Christianity really provides that because it's yep. you and God, and everybody else is out of the picture. It's a, it, Christianity is you talking to God, and God is worried about you. He's worried about your sins. He's worried about you going to heaven or hell. He's built this whole universe, and the only thing on God's mind is whether or not you're masturbating. You are really his main concern. In That's right. So. And uh, it, this uh, can be very motivating for a lot of people. Um, and uh, if they lack this st story or it's been destroyed for us, we go into a meaning crisis. Yeah, now, th they... <laughs> I was going to say they... Oh, I can't remember what train of thought I was going with there. <clears throat> they have the larger story. Oh, egoism. Like like Christopher Hitchens said about them, they said the religious are so contradictory, they're so hypocritical, they say uh, they're so humble. Oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, be, I'm, ve I'm being very humble. Please get out of my, my way. I'm on a, on a mission from Jesus. <clears throat> <laughs> How humble of you to be on a mission from Jesus. And, and so the humility Absolutely. that you're fine, you, you do have, you could uh, mute your mic, I think, can you? When you, if you need to, there's a, uh, the humility item from Jesus um, comes at the Christians from this angle um, and makes them these self-centered, the center of the universe, a very egoistic center of the universe, being humble. Uh, it's quite a contradiction, but if we do need this larger narrative story that places us as the hero, as the egoistic center, if everybody needs to have their ego caressed in some way, and Christianity does this in spades, I don't know where the humility thing comes in but uh, they've got the they've got the hero and they've got the the individual centered philosophy that's apparently necessary to get an individual's attention yeah um so um uh, this narrative is unavoidable um, when when um, when uh, Ayn Rand said that Everyone needs a philosophy, and everyone has a philosophy. That's true. Everyone do need. Everyone does need a, a philosophy, and we all have one, whether we want it or not. We haven't maybe formulated, but we need it. <clears throat> but I would surmise that she didn't include her uh, understanding of art into that phrase because. Everyone also needs a narrative. Now, that's what she means by everyone needs art in their life. 
Well, if, if we don't have philosophies in a formal way, which 95% of people don't have a formal philosophy, then whatever that is that she refers to as a philosophy uh, is something else. And you're saying yeah. it's a narrative. You're saying it's a story. What I'm also saying is that there's no reason that just because you have a rational philosophy that you should drop the story. So even if we... Get, so once we get once we get a rational philosophy, us five percenters, we we still need a story. The rest of mankind isn't. That's all they have is some story. Well, I, I think that we can be more hopeful than the more than five percent. I think that uh, it's actually a lot easier for for the vast majority of people, like fifty percent or more, to know that they are they are. Imp embedded inside of a story and understand that this is a tool for meaning. Uh, but I think that uh, I don't believe in the exceptional man that can just live without a, a narrative. We Even, even people who have a perfectly um, uh, a rational philosophy needs to build their own narrative. Now, by narrative, what... I mean, the ladies and gentlemen are going to wonder what you're proposing. Is my narrative of the Constitution and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson? I like that. I like that narrative, but I, I'm also talking about your personal narrative that you are fighting every single day. You're fighting dragons to create a, a, a better world for you and your family. The reason you get up uh, in, up in the morning is because you are the hero in your uh, in your uh, story. And that story involves conflict. Uh, Ayn Rand talks a lot about this in the art of fiction. Uh, I think I think it's that's the book where she says that in any good story needs to have conflict. If there's no conflict, there's no room for that's the the space of free will, right? Because it's only when you have difficult choices to make that free will shines. And we we humans need to have free will shine. So therefore, part of designing a good life is to design a life with conflict, where we are the heroes in that path through the life. And so therefore, if you choose your life in such a way that it's just easy, everything is just easy, you're outside of the story. You're just floating somewhere and you're not in, in the conflict zone where the stories happen. And therefore, you're going to feel you're, you get bored, and you feel your life get meaningless. Now, is this why objectivism's quite attractive? Then, because it does give a narrative, it does make you the center stage, it gives you the hero position, it gives you all the buttons. Buttons you're saying, and then that seem to get pushed by religion. Yeah, but uh, notice that uh, objectivism provides only <coughs> uh, this, like literal stories by Ayn Rand. Plus the very generic story of you as hero in your life. It's not specific to your life. Right. So you need to you need to make it specific to your life. Now, <clears throat> whether you call this religious or just like we are narrative nar narrating beings, we we, we don't just uh, just uh, walk around doing oh I like this today then I like that and um, I want this and I, then I did that. You're trying to build something for the for the long haul. All right. Then, well, uh, can I propose that that Atlas Shrugged is going to be more solid in the long haul than Christianity because Christianity ultimately rings hollow for a lot of people. I I, I completely uh, agree with that. That Atlas Shrugged is going to uh, have have a solid state solid staying power for a long long time, and quite possibly much longer than Christianity. But that doesn't mean that we have to dismiss the fact that it, it Christianity has, has actually survived for 2,000 years. So it is, for various reasons, an appealing story. Well, that's, we very, that, that's like coming – that's like you, there's a stone castle and we build a steel skyscraper and then a whole bunch of people get noisy <coughs> and they start saying, what is this new steel skyscraper garbage? We need to go back to stone castles that lasted for 2,000 years. So just because it's some piece of garbage has been there for 2,000 years doesn't mean we can't do a better job than it. No, but it, it's also f easy to fall into the progressive slash satanic error of 
assuming that everything that exists uh, in the past is garbage, that, on, uh, that uh, salvation is only in the future through progress. <clears throat> there might be things in the past that can, are salvageable and that you need to salvage. Do you propose that we keep the old stone castle, maybe make a museum of it and, and sort of yep. respect it? Yes, because we want to know, in order to give salience meaning to the skyscraper, we need to know where we came from. This is also one of the reasons I think that people should, as, as an important part of their growing up, like live out into the wilderness, have to be in touch with nature, uh, build campfire, try to live without uh, technology, to to feel really on their bodies what it means like to ha not have technology. Because that storyline gives meaning to technology. You, you, you get thankful and grateful and, and you appreciate uh, that lights actually are on and, and they work. And the windows, you can see out of your building, and uh, it's not so drafty in the winter. You appreciate it more if you know where you came from. Yes. So uh, I, I'm just now given one example how, like, the, every, every progressive who, is, who thinks that America is the most evil place, uh, they, they obviously have never spent a night outdoor without technology, right? They, they are living so comfortable lives that they're super bored, that they can afford to hate the place that gives them all these comforts. And clearly then they have not had sufficient uh, um, pain in their life, uh, ad ad adversity. They haven't, they haven't been part of a story. And then they find a story which is destroy America and they go for that story, right? Mm -hmm. Because now they don't have to be bored anymore. Now they have a, a mission. They can, uh, because there's so much to destroy. I mean, if they're not very good creators, at least they can destroy, right? And be vir and be virtuous by doing that, destroying something evil. That's what virtue yeah. signaling is all about: is them trying to take part, play the hero, be part in the narrative. Yes, they're trying to be the hero. So whenever you hear a male feminist, he's trying to be a, a fake himself into being a hero. And as Jordan Peterson quite correctly points out, that's kind of creepy. Uh, like, uh, never, ever trust a male feminist. Is like, that what he said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, uh, so beware of those who make stories that are too good to be true. Like Beto O'Rourke that says that white people are the most ra racist people on earth. You know that he's a Harvey Weinstein kind of time that goes around like raping in in his uh, spare time uh, it's because only a real beta male uh wannabe rapist be, uh, talks like that right yeah he's he's a beta for sure absolutely so he, he he's like he's a uh, he's a loser and he is he's he's parasiting on on a, on a hero story where he can inject himself as a parasite into a, in this, into the state of a hero by uh, slamming other people. It's like it's like a little child who wants to feel strong by torturing its cat. That's Beto O'Rourke. That's Beto O'Rourke. It's sick. Uh, and and you should be wary of people like that. Um, so. <clears throat> so when I listen to Jordan Peterson, he doesn't have that in him, that malevolence. But he keeps on warning about the malevolence in uh, that if you are suffering over a long period of time, it's so easy to fall prey to malevolence. You know, um, I mean, I do want to sort of brand him as having a malevolent universe premise. Yes, right? he does. But yeah. notice how good, like, and that's bad. Right, it's not good that he has this malevolence uh, focused on life is suffering, blah blah blah. But I but take it, it, I take it as the pendulum swinging a bit, like uh, it swung too far the other way, where everybody thinks the world is so, um, everybody gets free health care, everybody gets all the food they want, everybody gets a warm house, 
And he's like, no, 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 no. We've got a tough world. So he wants to push the pendulum back, or he's on the pendulum as it swings the other way. And he says, not everything's cozy. Sometimes uh, your parents are going to die. Sometimes you're gonna, your house will burn down. There's a car wreck. Life's tough, too. Life goes the other side. So he's just sort of the at the echoing back and forth of the pendulum of this. And notice how this is one of his bad conceptualizations that life is suffering. That is a very bad conceptualization of life. Like, if you want to summarize life, that's not really what you should be summarizing life as. I do understand what he says. I see that is this is one of, let's call it his dyslectic thinking, that he's, he's not a very good conceptualizer. And he says things that, yeah, I understand what he's saying. He's not saying exactly what he's saying, but he's just not good enough to say it in a, a proper way. Well, I, I view it as, his view is people just go along in life doing pretty mundane, meaningless stuff, and then once in a while somebody dies or there's a car wreck or something, and, and that's hard to deal with, and then you go back to just doing your meaningless stuff. And that seems to be his general view of life. And if you want some meaning, clean your room and get a job. Yes. Now, a much better conceptualization is done by Ayn Rand in one of her most famous uh, statements, which is, uh, I don't have it, it's on Ayn Rand lexicon, uh, uh, where she talks about the, the definition of life. Uh, life uh, has value because there's a, it can be destroyed. Uh, you have a fundamental choice between life and death, right? You can't destroy a rock. You can rearrange it, but you can't destroy it. I want to mention Howard Rourke and a quick scene from The Fountainhead, which you may remember, uh, because if life is values, this scene is an interesting scene. He was standing there watching a truck take a load of granite up a hill to a building site of one of his new houses he was having built, and a car drove by with some people in it and some girl in the back with a hat on playing a ukulele, and they were all laughing and screaming in the car. And he said there's something very different about this day, because for him it was a day of happiness and joy, and for them, on the surface, it seems to be a day of happiness and joy because they're all together in a car drinking and playing the ukulele and driving around. And he said, there's something very fundamentally different between us. But then he couldn't think about it. He went back to looking at the truck pulling the granite up the hill. That's very interesting, yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's, a, uh, that's a good point because now he's saying, basically, he's building his story, right? Uh, uh, just uh, to, to play on a little uh, 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 a pun here, maybe a two-story building. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, so what I mean with when uh, Ayn Rand uh, paints a fundamental uh, choice between life and death, what she's really saying is that death is the background upon which life is the foreground. You cannot have life without also having death. And you, life does not have meaning if you don't have a death as a constant threat in the background. So life is the song, death is the silence. That's a way of saying it. I would say you can paint it also in Gestalt theory. You can't have a foreground without a background. Right, right. Life is the foreground, death is the background. Yeah. And so we're always struggling against the background or in the context of the background, relative to the background. Now, I, call, I have given a name to this. I call it biologic. Um, uh, and and it's inter I like that idea, that concept, because often philosophers try to look at some idea or concept and leave real life out of it like let's think about morality but you can't think about morality without the biological entities acting so you can't divorce the two so biologic would mean that we don't get to do uh, divorced from reality philosophizing rationalizing because for us the core of reason is true and false but truth represents life 
false is falsification of life, with, which is death. That's the fundamental binary choice, truth and falsehood, life and death. So that's a biologic. Life equals truth, death equals false. Oh, bio not as in biology, but as in two? No, I, I, this is, I call it biologic to, as a pun on biologic. Oh, that's right? what I thought. Okay, yeah. So, but it's logic. It's true false statement, but it's it's in by bi building in a, a logic out of biology. So bio the field of biology is actually uh, uh, is a study of, of logic, because a study of life versus death, which is on off, true false. Biologicology. <laughs> Very nice. Like uh, so <clears throat> my point here is that uh, Ayn Rand did this conceptualization. She, she said that uh, the basis of values is the fundamental choice between life and death, and the, the, the conflict between them. And Jordan Peterson misses the boat on that by saying the fundamental, the fundamental conflict in life is to suffer. No, yeah, he so suffering he, is he just, just it. For what? Like, there's, no he, he so have, that, there's no conflict in life then. No. You're no. born, you suffer, it's, you die. So, so uh, in other words, this just represents the fact that he's a very bad conceptualizer. Is he is he missing out on a hero narrative then? Is he ultimately going to echo hollow unless he can unless unless he can hearken to re religion, then he's going to be hollow at the end of the day. Is that Well, I I think that he's got his his path is going to burn out. Like he's never going to get there on his own. But that doesn't mean that other people who are better conceptualizers than him can pick up on his insights, uh, the work he's doing, and say, nice work, we're, take over, we're taking over from here. Well, and it, what work is he doing? All he's pointing out is that the modern culture is bankrupt and has left us with a, a vacuum. He's doing much more than that. When he's talking about, uh, uh, he's talking about the lizard brain. He's talking about the evolution. Things having a very, uh, structure in our, our our brain that has a history of like fifty million years or longer, and that plays a role today. So he's placing life into a much longer context than in just right now. Well, yeah, but there are there are a lot of thinkers that do that. Um, but I, I'm, but really, I'm, tempted, yes. I'm tempted to think in 50 years he will just be forgotten. It, that might be so, but he, uh, the, the, that, does, that doesn't mean that the ideas that he's talking about, which is m mainly about biology and evolution, uh, that those should be forgotten. And on the contrary, that should be the backdrop of an incomplete un understanding of human beings. Why, why on earth shouldn't it? Yeah, but he can't get there at all, and... That's what I'm saying. People, you say, you, uh, it's like people are waiting for him. I keep listening to his speeches and waiting for him to say something new or say something else or say something solid, make a step, build something, put a foundation down or something. He just never gets there. He just Every speech is just more talking and more talking and more talking. So that's why I say I think he'll be forgotten in 50 years. But he, it, to the extent that he's doing valid, any valid integrations, those are going to have to be accepted by they're partially accepted by a wider group they're going to have to be interwoven with a wider philosophy or i mean yeah he, and he's he not doing no, that yeah he has no philosophy at all he has no philosophy no. at all no, but he's he's sort of he is in he is sort of fighting his life uh, every day getting up in the morning uh, <clears throat> trying to uh, make micro improvements to his life right so he, so he is sort of trying to live the heroic life but he has very low uh, uh, ambition levels for that. Yeah, he has low ambition levels for, and and his advice is pretty low ambition level. I mean, and, it is good that, advice. It's good advice to yeah. start by cleaning up your room. You know, that's good advice. And for, for some people, they need to start basics. They yeah. need to start simple. So, uh, like, that's fine. Yeah. But where do you go when you've uh, mastered, like, the... the that's the problem that I'm. Uh, that Jordan Peterson talks to the people who are actually uh, in the far lower end of the uh, of the success spectrum of, of human flourishing, right? 
But what does it do with those who are not there, who are actually leading pretty good lives, which are most people or uh, the upper half? He can't really conceive of that because it's not in his universe. His universe. What? What? What do you say? He says to them. I say he. He doesn't really. He doesn't say anything them. to them. Yeah. It, it, his talk. That's why he's talking to the lower end of the spectrum. So this is why I jokingly sometimes refer to him as like a very pessimistic, dark version of Ayn Rand. Like if Ayn Rand was very uh, pessimistic in life, she might have ended up like a Jordan Peterson. She was talking to the people at the top, John Galton, Howard Rourke. Whereas he says, oh, wait, I, I, I'm not even thinking about trying to get there. I'm just trying to get through my day. Yeah, yeah, she, he's a he's a pessimistic version of, but still you've got to get through your day and try to do what's right and blah blah blah. But it's all pretty hopeless, and then we're gonna die. Yeah, so he doesn't have a positive message for those who've actually accomplished these things, and he doesn't integrate uh, <clears throat> his findings along the way into a, a conceptual framework, into a theory. So he can, he doesn't do any of that, which is sad, uh, but. Okay, that leaves more work to others. So we got to so, pick up where he left off, or somebody does. Yeah, and and this is what I keep on saying. I I've told it to Rucka. I've told it to everyone who uh, uh, wants to listen. Is that why on earth would you let some other people who have a bad philosophy own facts, own science, own statistics? That's insane. Objectivists should just take ownership in everything that has to do with science and facts. And whenever someone makes a discovery uh, that's important to human flourishing, take ownership in it. Make it into, a, a, like, give it a, an objectivist spin on it. Instead of saying, no, 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 I don't like those facts, and I reject this and that, reject that. So Rocco still, uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, trash talk uh, Rock, Rock or anything, but he still says that he doesn't trust IQ science. I think that's still a cop out because there's so much good science there. I, yes, there's some bad science, but IQ is not rocket science. Like I keep on saying this, that you can prove almost very easily by a simple rational argument by logic that IQ must be genetic because it evolved through natural selection and anything that nat evolves through natural selection has to be genetically based right right but now Proof. and now what what they're just going to say what what does iq matter really when you've got north and south korea next to each other it's clear that iq isn't the deciding factor well, no, obviously, uh, it, it, IQ is uh, is not as important as some people want to say, but it it does matter to you whether you have an IQ of eighty or one hundred and twenty because it sets limits on what you in your life can do. So you should know your IQ, and you should know and tailor your, your life to your height and to your uh, IQ and to your talents. If you're not a great singer and <clears throat> your voice is screwed, you should not try to become a world singer. Would a, pro uh, you would, would a proper education system, maybe we're getting off the subject to Jordan Peterson a bit here, would, yeah. a, would a proper education system um, uh, sort of try to tailor education to IQ? Yes. That's going to make people nervous because you're going to teach different things to different people depending on their IQ? No. What you're saying is that uh, uh, they are pacing at different speeds. And that they might, some people will just never get to the stuff that the very high IQ people learn because they just run away. They run faster. All right. Well, let's leave that for IQ and education, a different video. Yeah, that will, yeah. let's do that. So just to end on, on Jordan Peterson, some people think that I'm a fanboy of Jordan Peterson. Uh that's strange. I, I know that you're not a fanboy, and uh, like I follow his uh, his work because for two reasons, he people are listening to him, and he's making Christians interested in evolution. That makes me very very interested. Number one, because I want Christians to become more rational, to uh, adopt uh, evolution. Number two, in addition to having uh, be, uh, like being. Uh, 
popular um, in the right people, the, the persuasive, he also makes some important uh, scientific and theoretical points. He's bringing attention to some science and some facts and some evidence and some reasoning that we should be paying attention to, like this uh, eternal perspective, like uh, evolution and so forth. He's maybe not the, uh, the, the, the final say in that, but at the moment, he's the only proponent that gets the airtime on that. Yeah, I keep up with his work too, and I think we should, and uh, not that there's much to keep up with anymore. I mean, it's a lot of repetition of the same points over and over. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't follow so much now anymore. I'm looking forward to his, his next biblical series, if he ever comes there, so I'll see what, what happens with that. But apart from that, I'm not really paying much attention to him anymore, but to people who follow him, like Paul Vanderclay, I still listen to his work, and I do follow John Verbecki. Uh, so I, uh, I, I definitely would advise people who are interested in, in those topics to look at John Verbecki. Um, but like as I say, Jordan, I don't believe that Jordan Peterson is ever going to get to a, a, a conceptual framework because he's not a good conceptualizer. So that's his downside. But yeah. okay, so so he's not he's not the most wonderful person in the world. Uh, Big deal. Yeah, I wanted him to be introduced to objectivism so that he could have a, a, a framework to put stuff into, and he we did. We brought him to objectivism, and he's he's too, his head is too full of the fact that people are listening to him right now, and he thinks his message is good enough to go forward with, and he doesn't want to reevaluate everything and figure everything out right now. He's Well, the thing is, after you've been <coughs> invested in a, a line of reasoning for 30 years, like he has... You're not just going to turn around. There's momentum to your thinking, and you just don't want to say, "Oh, everything I thought was wrong." Yeah. But uh, so there's, but just because he doesn't turn around and says that objectivism is great, let's just use the fact that he's uh, name dropping Ayn Rand all the time. Uh, that's nice, uh, and that brings attention to people who talk about Ayn Rand. And if people Google people who talk about Ayn Rand and Jordan Peterson. Maybe they come across conversations like this or something like that. That's good. Uh, and then they will see, oh, there's people out there who take the message uh, of Jordan Peterson seriously, but at the same time bring it in another direction that he wasn't doing. So I like if, if I was going to present my take on Jordan Peterson for my own sake, I, I think that he doesn't go far enough in, in doing conceptualization of his work to bring it into a rational, conceptual domain. And I'm, I'm perfectly willing to do that work for him uh, so that uh, I, it can enrich uh, the philo uh, ra rational philosophy. Because many people uh, get, get in love with objectivism and say that you don't need anything other than objectivism. But objectivism is just the philosophy of Ayn Rand, and she never pretended that rational philosophy stopped with her. Like, uh, Peikoff has made contribution with Dim, um, and Binswanger has made contribution with uh, uh, teleological, uh, uh, the biological basis of teleologi teleological concepts, and so forth. So you have many people making contributions to rational philosophy apart from uh, Ayn Rand, but it's not part of the object objectivism. And... Uh, so just because it, this is what I'm talking about, like taking the stuff, the good parts of Jordan Peterson and turning it into rational philosophy uh, doesn't mean that I, I'm saying bad things about objectivism. I'm just saying that Ayn Rand doesn't talk too much about narratives. I mean, she mentions it, and you can, you can see that it's consistent with her thinking, just like Dim is consistent with her thinking, but she never talks about him uh, as concisely and precisely as as Peikoff does. That doesn't mean that Ayn Rand was wrong or it was she was bad or anything. It just means that Peikoff was good, and it's good that he's expanding her universe of re reason into a new domain. Uh, and this, this, that's what I will want, want to try to do with biology uh, and biologic, right? Uh, and I, I, that's probably going to be a, a huge part of my conceptualization of, of not just Jordan Peterson, but uh, 
taking the good stuff out of Jordan Peterson and uh, placing it in, in a conceptual, larger conceptual framework. Well, uh, Jordan Peterson doesn't have a lot of good stuff by himself. I mean, he taught. He he has a lot of knowledge. He's a, an aggregator, uh, and in that sense, he does have good things. But like but, bi uh, biological um, evolutionary psychology, though, that's not a Jordan Peterson thing. That's just something he partakes of. Um, precisely. But he he's an aggregator, and like aggregation is actually a, an important job. Like being the first discoverer, the one to bring facts together. That's integration, right? Yeah. So, so I'm not going to take away that part for him. He's he's pointing out connections between things that people should be looking at. Yeah. And he's not doing a good job with that because he's just saying, look here and here and here. They are connecting somehow and not giving a good conceptual understanding of it. But he is pointing in the right direction. Some, um, sometimes when he says that we shouldn't be so concerned with rights, he's doing a bit of damage, I'm afraid. Yeah, so that's an example where he's sloppy. In his in his thinking and his words, he, uh, he claims to be very precise in, in his language, but that's an example where he's not precise in his language. Because if he was precise, he would say um, that in, uh, legitimate rights are not just good; they are extremely important. Whereas these uh, social rights that are illegitimate, uh, they they are not good. And being concerned with using guns to get become happy. Is generally speaking a bad thing. This is what he's uh, criticizing the social justice warriors for, but he's not saying it in a very good way, obviously. So you, uh, you can translate that what he said, the bad stuff, in easily into what he's really trying to say in precise language that sounds good, but uh, he's not saying it in a good way. Uh, so there's a lot of bad stuff in Jordan Peterson, mostly because he's a uh, fuzzy sloppy thinker, he's not a good conceptualizer, and he's not precise in some areas where it's very important to be precise. So uh, uh, it might be a bad conceptualization to say that um, uh, narrative equals a uh, narrative and metaphor equals religion, for instance. I understand that re religion is deeply tied up with metaphorical thinking. There's no such thing as religion. There's only narrative and metaphor and conceptualizing a larger story. There isn't actually a god. Well, uh, that's not the same as saying there's no such thing as religion. Well, a religion doesn't refer to anything outside the brain. You could say that. Uh, that's a, but religion, uh, religion is a state of mind, right? So in that sense, it does exist. Well, a narrative is a state of mind. Yeah. A larger so, is, narrative uh, is just a word for larger context. Just our understanding of our of our larger context. It's more than a, a context because it has a specific uh, linear structure to it. A narrative. All right. Let's do a video on what is narrative and religion because that's yeah. a, that's a different subject we're trying this one's yeah. supposed to be jordan why jordan peterson's wrong right yeah I, th I think we covered that topic now so we can fi we can sort of finish here with a clear conscience uh, of of that i think did did we bash him enough now i think so we, uh, no. we'll we'll see maybe we'll need to bash him more <laughs> there's not All a right. lot there's not a lot to bash though i mean he's not he's He's just bumbling. He's just a bumbling guy. So, okay. Yeah. So, like, uh, there's a lot of uh, people who are bumbling. Uh, so, I, I'm not going around bashing people just because of that. Right. But I, I do think it's important to point out that it, it, Peterson is not a great thinker, just because he talks about things that it, it, he has been able to get to through 30 years of of hard work that are important doesn't mean that he is the one that's going to bring it all together into a conceptual framework. He's, I don't think he is, right. because he's not that good at conceptualization. All right, well, let's draw a line there. We're not Peterson fanboys just because Peterson said one or two true things. All right. Correct. There we go.